Go to the book of Jude, if you would. The book of Jude. That is a powerful song. That continues to be a powerful song. And many, many Baptists, you know, we may get to the place where we just sing it without thinking and use it for invitations and such as that. But that is a compelling message and song, no doubt about it. All right, in the little book of Jude. Now, before we read, I want to talk to you here for just a moment and um, take you back to a statement I made this morning about uh, the days of Fanny Crosby when she wrote in a song that uh, God is faithful and near and protects and keeps, though the world is growing wild. Amen. And she looked at the times and determined this would have been in about the mid-1850s, maybe as far up as 1870, 75, somewhere in there. But something was going on in her world where she would... Uh, write or pen the words in a song, though the world is growing wild. And I think uh, we can kind of relate to that, can't we? Uh, at home and abroad, there's much to be concerned about. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm not worried, but it doesn't mean you can't be concerned. And I mentioned this morning, I, I, I pray for the uh, people of uh, Ukraine. And I'm praying that God will, I don't know if you ever noticed reading this or not, but God told him that, uh, told an evil king, I'm going to put a hook in your nose and pull you back. And I'm praying that uh, Vladimir Putin would have a hook in his nose placed there by God, jerk him around a little bit, which will happen in due time, I understand. But the suffering and the misery of the people there in this war is just incredible. And then, again, that's abroad, this is home, and, uh, and there in Ukraine, that's not the only chaos in our big world, and that's going on in our time. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick my neck out here and say that nobody in their right mind that is in this room or a citizen of this country, nobody in their right mind would say, I sure wish I could trade places with Jude. I'd rather live then than now. Right. I assure you of this. You would not want to have lived as Jude did under the Roman authority Amen. and the constant oppression. Right. How many of you think that we are overtaxed here in America? Yeah, I do. I do. And it's not going to get better uh, unless somehow we can find a way to go $30 trillion in the hole and it not cost anybody. This is all going over good, so I don't know. Maybe we ought to have some songs to start over, you know. Uh, I don't know, but, but I'm, I'm just saying, it, it's incredible what is taking place. It truly is. But if we lived in Jude's day, we would understand what overtaxation is. Amen. And uh, we, we don't know anything about being overtaxed like the people of Jude's day did under the Roman oppression. Amen. And I, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it's just, it's a fact. And as far as sin and evil, I know that uh, when you look at uh, the uh, country and, and the moral decline in our country, it is alarming, isn't it? It's sad. It's pathetic. Uh, but I have to inform you that under the Roman Empire, one of their own philosophers and thinkers and writers spoke of Rome, his own city as a Roman, and he spoke of it and said that Rome is a cesspool of iniquity into which all the dregs of the empire flow. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Right. So he's talking about this glorious city of Rome. We're talking about the ruler of a man by the name of Nero, and Jude is living in that time. Think about it. And so, again, we're not the first ones to live in difficult times or hard times or to see the world growing wild or to have a chaos and confusion in the world. He understood what it was like. He really did. And besides that, as a teacher, as an apostle, as a perhaps probably the half-brother of our Lord, uh, Jude understood also that the faith that he had embraced, the faith in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God, you might remember there were times that even his brethren did not believe in him. 
him, and he was well into his public ministry. And, and yet they, Jude came to the conclusion, this is the Messiah. He is the Messiah, and he embraced that truth and that reality. And now he is wanting to write to the saints about what he called the common salvation. That when he first was going to write this letter, it was going to be about the common salvation. That just simply means the salvation that's common to all of us that are saved. Right. Yeah, many of us have read about the salvation of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Amen. Now, I got saved the same way he did. Right. Huh. Well, yeah, I was only a six-year-old boy, and I wasn't in that part of the world, and I didn't get smitten blind, but I did have to come to grips with my sin. Right. And humble myself before God and believe in Jesus Christ. That's why it saved Paul. It wasn't all the stuff surrounding him. It was his awareness of his sinfulness Amen. and the authority of Jesus and the fact that he is the Messiah. That's Amen. what saved him. Praise just like everybody else. So if anybody's saved, then they're saved by the common salvation. There's no this kind of salvation, that kind of salvation, and another kind. I remember one of our staff members said one time after camp, he had uh, four boys that had gotten saved at camp, and he got them up there on a Sunday night after camp, and we were having testimonies and a great time and everything. And he said, this is Billy, he got saved. And this is, I'm making these names up now, this is a long time ago, Bobby, and he got saved. And this is Jimmy, and he got saved. Now here's Freddie, he really got saved. <laughs> so he kind of had to explain that there is no such thing as saved, barely saved, almost saved, uh, and then really saved. If you're saved, you're saved by the common Amen. salvation. Amen. Anyway, I don't have time for all that. Jude wants to write of the common salvation, but he said, I can't, I can't. It's needful for me, rather, he says, to earnestly uh, to uh, exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith Amen. which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. Now, why, question, why would Jude drop the idea of a devotional letter about the common salvation and tell them instead to pick up the sword, spiritually, to pick up the sword and to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints? Why would he do that unless the faith was under attack? Amen. And the faith was under attack. And as a matter of fact, if you look in the little book of Jude beginning in verse number 4, he said there are certain men crept in unawares. Creepers were coming in. And they were denouncing the authority of Jesus, the lordship of Jesus, the deity of Jesus Christ. And uh, then from verse number 4, watch this now, all the way down to verse number 19, here's what Jude is doing. Can I show you what he's doing? He's pulling the cover off the false teachers Amen. and revealing them or exposing them as false teachers. And that's what he's doing in the body of this letter from verse number 4 all the way down to verse number 19. He is exposing the false teachers. And what he is doing is he is letting the people know, and it still lives in the Word of God, let us know. Amen. Number one, false teachers do exist. You can't believe everybody that uses the name of Jesus. Somebody help me right there. You can't believe everybody that says they read something in the Bible. Amen. And you can't believe everybody that talks about God. That's not so. That's what they did, and they were deceivers. False teachers do exist. The second thing he say, mentions is why they are false teachers or what motivates them. And if you take the little book of Jude and put it together with its companion passage, the second chapter of Second Peter, then what you see is they are motivated by greed. They are teaching wrongly willfully on purpose to get a following after them for the sake of personal gain. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let me see, if you look down at verse number 16 of our, of our little book of Jude here, he says, these are murmurs, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Now that's what Jude said, and Peter says it even stronger in 2 Peter chapter 2, exposes their motive, personal gain, selfishness is why they were doing it. The third thing he says about the false teachers is they're in big trouble with God. They are under condemnation and they will be judged. He goes all the way back to Enoch and says, Enoch, now come on, the seventh from Adam, Enoch prophesied of these saying. So Enoch, the prophet, 
uh, before the Lord, he, he uh, walked with the Lord and he was not for the Lord took him. Before he was taken, he preached. Amen. And among the other things he preached, he exposed the false teachers. Right. So let's just look at it like this. And the preaching clock hasn't started yet because we're not even starting into the text where we're going. Is everybody with me here on that? Yeah, now everybody's together. That's great. And so, uh, but, but here's what Judas is doing. If you went through and saw how he exposed it, many people would read this and say, wow, this is a kind of a negative tone to it. It's uh, all about these men that are doing wrong and the judgment they're going to come under. I'm talking about real judgment. You can read that in verse 14 and 15 uh, sometime and just see that God is, they're under God's condemnation. God is going to judge them in no uncertain terms. And look at the last words he says about the false teachers in verse 19. Now watch this. He said, These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. You know what contemporary preaching would say? Many uh, contemporary pulpits, uh, if you said that about false teachers today, you shouldn't judge. Right. You're being too judgmental. Well, these are Holy Ghost inspired words. Amen ladies and gentlemen, and false teaching is false teaching, whether it's Jude's day or this day, and it ought to be exposed whether it was Jude's day or this day. And, it's, and, and because the Word of God has already passed judgment on what is truth and what is not. saying we're supposed to preach it. All right, anyway, that's not even the message. Look down at verse 20. In verse 20, the tone of the whole letter changes. Verse number 4 down through verse 19 the exposure of the false teachers and their coming judgment. But in verse number 20, it's like a sweet melody comes into view right here, where Jude says, But ye, beloved. Amen. Now let's stand and read together the rest of the little book of Jude. Would you please and honor Amen. the word of God? Amen. And I'm going to read in verse 20, all the way through verse 25, although 24 and 25 is not a part of our message tonight, but it's too good not to read, all right? So look in verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Amen. And of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, Amen. to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, Amen. dominion and power both now and ever, and everybody said, Amen. 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 What a powerful passage. Now I want you to go back to verse number 21. And um, I've got underlined especially, it's not the only thing I have underlined here, but I have this underlined especially in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Amen. But ye, beloved, among other things we're going to talk about, keep yourselves in the love of God. Father, I want to say thank you once again for your precious word. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for men and women who deem it right and important to on this Lord's Day assemble together, not just this morning, but tonight. And without getting off track, I just want to say what a blessing it is to see a, a good representation of the flock back for the Sunday night service as many Baptist churches across America sit dark tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I pray that you would bless your people, and yes. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work. And help us to know what it means to keep ourselves yes. help us, Lord. in the love of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. <laughs> little uh, something in your imagination to get a, a little vision of, just kind of think, a very simple little illustration here, just think of the old wagon wheel. And uh, I'm talking about the wagons, covered wagons and the old wagons of the old days. And uh, I'm thinking about the, the uh, hub of that wagon wheel attached to the axle. 
And then you have the rim of the wheel. So what do you have to do to make this thing whole? If you've got the rim and you've got the hub, what is it that's needed? Well, you've got to have the spokes that are needed. And uh, so you've got to have that part that reaches from the hub out to the rim so it'll hold it together, and that's a part of the wheel. Now, the reason I mention that is I want you to look at our passage tonight, which we're going to cover verse 20 through 23 with only a reference to the last verses that we read. And in verse 20 through 23, I want you to think of that wagon wheel, and the hub of it is this, keep yourselves in the love of God. That, that, that is the heart of what he is saying here in verse 20 through 23, ye beloved, in light of all else that is going on, uh, all the false teaching, all the heresy that is being propagated, uh, all the twisting and wrenching of the scripture and uh, disregard for the deity of Jesus Christ. With all of that, ye beloved, here's what you need to focus on. When the rest of the world is going crazy, when there's an attack upon freedom, there is an attack upon the faith and upon the gospel itself, when all of that is taking place, beloved, here's what you do. You keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, we need to talk about that for just a little bit. I think I can show you how and why I say that it is the heart of this passage. Uh, but first of all, maybe we better make sure we understand what it means to keep yourself in the love of God. Amen. Years ago, I was pastoring in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and um, I, well, our church was out on the east edge of town, and the street that went by at the far east edge of town, which is not the edge of town anymore as it expands, but nonetheless, it was Jardo Street. And so uh, the church is right over here, and my uh, soul winning partner and I, Cedro, a Spaniard man, uh, he had a situation where he wasn't working there for a time, so he wanted to go soul winning with me. And so I'd take Cedro, and we were out knocking doors and going soul winning and prospecting and such as that. And so as we're going along, I'm only a couple of blocks from the church, and I knock on this door, and a man answers the door, and I said, Hello, my name's Sam Davison, and I pastor the Bible Baptist Church uh, right down the road on Jardo. And uh, this is my partner here, Cedro. And we just came by today because we're knocking doors in the neighborhood, and I, I made my approach and gave my spiel, you know, about what I was there. And he kind of leaned against the door, and he said, I want to ask you a door jam there. He didn't invite us in, leaning against the door jam, and he said, I want to ask you a question. I said, fire away. He said, are you one of them that believe in, and then he kind of got a snarl on his face, are you one of them that believe in once saved, always saved? And I said, well, yes, I am. And he said, that's what I thought. Well, it turns out he was a free will Baptist. I'm not here to bash them. I'm just going to say it's a part of their official doctrine that there is no such thing as eternal security or what sometimes is said in another way. One saved, always saved. You can be saved and then lose your salvation. And you get saved and you can lose it again and on and on and on. I've never had anybody explain to me how that works or how many sins it takes or what's the size of the sin it takes. Or when do you know you need to get saved again? I've never had anybody explain that. I've tried. Nobody's ever explained it. But anyway, he said, so, you, uh, yeah, I said, yes, that, that is exactly what we believe. And then he started in. He started with all the typical verses that are used about uh, you are fallen from grace. Never mind in the book of Galatians where it says you are fallen from grace. He is talking about those who are Judaizers that would trust the law to be saved. And if you reject the grace of God that is offered through Jesus Christ Amen. to try to find righteousness by the deeds of the law, then you are fallen from grace. These are people that are trying to be saved by keeping the law, not people that have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Now they're about to lose it. See, that's, but never mind the context. It says, you are fallen from grace. Everybody with me here? Some of you don't like sarcasm, so I'll try to watch that, but probably won't succeed, but I'm going to try. And, and then he pulled out the one that says, they that endure to the end shall be saved. Well, never mind that has to do with the time of the day of Jacob's trouble and the great tribulation. And God is speaking about the nation of the Jews and they that during uh, that uh, survive uh, to the end of that. That's where the apostles said, so then all Israel shall be saved. There'll be a time when Jesus comes in power and great glory Amen. and they will see and they Amen. will believe and they will be saved. 
But, but what he is saying is if you endure to the end, that right, means that if you're saved now, what you've got to do is hang on. He saved you, but it's up to you to hang on. That's basically what they're trying to say and teach. And so he had, though, and then the one that was supposed to be the clincher, he reached over by the door uh, on a little table and he picked up his Bible and said, let me show you this. And then guess where he turned? Jude. And he turned to this verse that we're talking about in verse 21. And it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. He said, what do you think that means? And I said, now, here's the thing. Number one, I don't like preachers telling stories where they're always the hero. I don't like that. But I am the hero in this one here. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm just kind of joking around. But uh, what happened is when he did that and pulled out the book of Jude, I couldn't help but smile inside because I just preached through about 11, 13 sermons through the book of Jude on Wednesday night. In the process, I had memorized the book of Jude, and I was thrilled myself with how much is in the book of Jude that's a help and a blessing and such as that. And so I was ready, and he said, look, he says right there, keep yourselves in the love of God. Amen. And I took his Bible, and I looked at that, and I said, I never realized that Jude was so confused. <laughs> he said, he wasn't confused. And I said, well, did you notice how he started? He said, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved Amen. in Jesus Christ, Amen. the endurance of our salvation, that is being in Jesus Christ, does not depend upon our, on our performance. We are preserved in Him because of Him, not because of us. Amen. And then I said, that's how he started the letter. Did you see, by the way, how he ended the letter? Now, unto him that is able to... You from, and you messed me up right there. Okay, now what? <laughs> uh, but unto him that is able to keep you from falling Amen. and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with seating, exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Father be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. And so how are we kept from falling? We're kept by him. Right. Amen. Come on, Peter put it this way. We are saved by the power of God. Lo and behold, we are kept by the power of God. Amen. And so Jude, whatever he is saying, when he says, keep yourselves in the love of God, he is not saying, he saved you, now it's up to you to keep it. Right. That's not true. Amen. But it is up to us to keep ourselves in love with God. Right. You see, well, it says to keep yourselves in the love of God. Let me ask you a question. What did you do for God to love you? Nothing is right. Amen. Absolutely nothing. I just uh, checking a moment ago over in Deuteronomy chapter 7 where uh, Moses is, uh, God is addressing Israel through Moses. And Moses said, The Lord did not set his love upon you because you are more in number than any people. The Lord did not set his love upon you because you're such a lovable people. In fact, if you followed Israel from Egypt through the wilderness, they were not uh, really a lovable people. At all. And yet God loved them. Amen. And so he did not set his love upon you because you're more in number. He didn't uh, set his love upon you because it is so appealing he couldn't help but love you. No. You know why he loved them? Here's what the Bible says. But because he loved you. Amen. <laughs> well, that's no answer. It is if God gives it. Because he didn't love them because of them. He loved them because of Him. Which would be true of you and me. Because when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. God didn't look out on the farm west of Perry, Oklahoma and see a six-year-old boy running around and said, oh, there's a lovable little boy. My sister sure didn't think so. And I'm sure there might have been others, including my parents, that may not have thought so at times. But God didn't look down and see somebody that was, oh, how could I not save a boy like that? Come on, we all came into the world the same way. Amen. Shaping in iniquity and speaking lies. We are all conceived in iniquity. We are all born in sin. And we all sin. It's not just that we have, we do. Right. See? And so the idea is that God... Uh, that we did nothing, rather, for God to love us 
and you can't do anything to keep God loving you. I'll read you the story sometime, or you can read the story of the prodigal God in Luke 15. Yeah, he said prodigal God. Well, no, it's the prodigal son. The story isn't primarily about the son. Amen. It's about his father. And by the way, prodigal doesn't mean wallowing in the mud and in the mire. Prodigal means extravagant, lavish, Amen. more than enough. You read that story carefully, and it wasn't the son that was lavish, extravagant, and was giving more than could be imagined. It was the father who was waiting him Amen. on him the whole time to come back. And when he did, what did he do? He lavished love upon him. He lavished Amen. forgiveness upon him. Amen. He brought the robe and the ring and put it on his finger and killed the fatted calf. Who is extravagant in that story, friend? It's God. And when you and I, as God's children, have gone astray like that boy did from his father, and we return, there he is, ready to forgive. Ready to show love. He loves us because of himself. We only love him because he... First loved us, Amen. see. But here is our, is our responsibility. Beloved, you loved ones of God, that's what that means. Amen. You that are beloved, this is my beloved wife. I'm glad my beloved wife came. What, is it, what do you mean your beloved wife? What do you think I mean? I love that woman. And I remember my introducing my mother to many people. I didn't often use the term, but I could have said this is my beloved mother. Or this is my beloved dad before my dad passed away at just age 70. He died of cancer. But I love my dad. Well, they are beloved because they are loved ones. Uh, we'd be happy to introduce you if we could to our grandchildren. Ten girls and one boy. Those girls are something now. I'm telling you, these are our beloved grandchildren. Well, why do you say that? We love them. Amen. Why is God in his word inspire his writers to call us his beloved? Because he loves us. Amen. That's why. You can't do anything about that. Amen. You can't make him love you. You can't earn his love. You can't earn his affection. It's already there. Jesus. Amazing. Amen. But you are responsible about whether you love him. Amen. You, you're definitely responsible. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God. Do you know what my responsibility is as a child of God? Uh, this is not an insignificant issue, ladies Amen. and gentlemen. It's really not. Do you know what my primary responsibility is as a believer in Jesus Christ? you know what it is? Amen. Love God. Praise the Lord. They came to Jesus and they said to him, Master, what is the first and great commandment? What Amen. did he say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Who should listen to that more than those who have become the children of God Amen. by reason of the grace of God through Jesus Christ? Amen. And so our first responsibility is to love God. I might remind you of this. When Jesus dealt with the failure of his own disciples and primarily Peter, and they are out there with the fire going, and he invites them and says, come and dine after a series of events. And they sit there and eat, and Jesus breaks the silence with the cloud of failure that's hanging over their head. What does Jesus say to Peter when he starts talking to him? Peter, will you work real hard for me? Will you work as hard for me as you did to be a fisherman? It's not what he said. Peter, will you travel far and work hard? Are you willing to suffer for me, Peter? I didn't know what he said. Right. You know what he said. Amen. And he said it three times. Right. Lovest thou me? Amen. Lovest thou me? Lovest thou me? Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm saying, this is not an insignificant issue here. Amen. What God primarily concerns is not how many hours do you spend at church this week? How much money did you put in this week? That's not God's primary concern. What is it? That whether we put in great amounts or not, that we love Him. Amen. Somebody may have more hours in than us. Not the issue. Do you love Him? Amen. Look at me a second. I am responsible for that. That is nobody else's responsibility. Amen. 
Uh, I've always said for a long, long, long time that the ways of the culture seem to find their way under the church door and get amongst the people of God and foul things up. Lo and behold, if we don't live in a culture where people uh, we refuse to accept personal responsibility, am I, true? Am, am I telling it right or not? We have a culture where people are not willing to accept personal responsibility. I'm just talking about culture-wide. And that mentality often uh, finds its way into the church door and into the lives and hearts of God's people because I seldom ever as a pastor talk to anybody that fell out of love with God or that got backslidden or got out of church that it was their fault. Generally, they had a whole plethora or list of people that they could blame for why they weren't where they were supposed to be in their spiritual life. Well, I'm here to tell you that no matter what anybody says about me, does about me, does to me, or thinks about me, or anything like that, if I am determined by the grace of God to follow the process of keeping myself in love with God, nobody can stop me from loving God. Nobody. Or you. This isn't braggadocious. I'm just telling you, he tells us right here how it is we keep ourselves in love of God. Amen. It's one thing to say, stay in love with God. It's another thing to say, man, our flesh is against us. My flesh is. The world is against us. The system of unbelief out here that rejects the Bible and the authority of God, that's called the world. Be not conformed to the world. Be you transformed. The world is against us. See if there's any, oh yeah, the adversary, the devil right. is against you. Right. He's at work. Nothing about the system of the world, nothing about our own flesh, nothing about the adversary is going to encourage us to be in love with God. Right. And yet that is the very thing that we are supposed to do, though the world is growing wild. Amen. We better focus on what we are supposed to focus on and what is important in the eyes of God. The first and great commandment, love God, beloved, and keep yourselves in the love of God. Amen. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, remember when you got saved? I remember when I got saved. I, I don't have time to tell the whole story, but I just remember uh, having been under conviction about it for a week. My parents not pressing the issue at all. And the second Sunday that I was under conviction about it, went to church. I told my dad, Dad, I need to get saved. He walked down the aisle with me. And on this side of the pulpit, I went knelt there with a man Amen. by the name of Chance, Mr. Chance. I can't remember his first name right now, but he was a deacon at that church where we were. And Mr. Chance knelt there with me and went through the scripture. And that's why I prayed and called upon Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I was only six years old. I'd heard about hell, but it's the first time I, and our preacher preached about hell two Sundays in a row. It's the first time I realized, hey, I'm going there as I am. Right. Amen. To know that there is a hell is one thing. To know that's where you're headed if you don't get saved. Now, that's right. another thing Amen. entirely. Right. And that's the day I got saved. I'm so thankful for that. I went back and sat down. And uh, did you know I don't ever remember anybody telling me, now, Sammy, that was my name back then. Don't call me that. Oh, I don't like that name. But anyway, now, now, Sammy, you need to love God, son. You need to love. Nobody had to tell me to love God any more than they had to tell me to love my own dad. Right. I love my dad. Right. I, I would say for a child not to love their father, something really perverse and weird has to happen for a child not to love their father. Would you agree with that? Right. Uh, well, well, even if you don't, I think it's still right. That, it, it, that it, something very weird and strange and perverse would have to happen right. for a child not to love his father. It's just there. Right. It's just there. Nobody ever told me to love my dad. I love my dad. Nobody had to tell me to love God. It's not the problem when you get saved. Well, one reason it shouldn't be a problem is because when you got saved, I just read in Romans chapter 5, here's what he did. He shed abroad His love in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto you. <laughs> so when you got saved, here's what He did. He shed His love abroad in heart. And by the way, the word shed doesn't mean a little touch of it, a little dose. The word shed, study the word out sometime. I, this, I found this very interesting. You know how you, you've seen guys in football games or stuff like that, and they winning a game, nobody does it to the loser coach, but to the winner coach, they take these big old containers of Gatorade or water, what it is, and they dump it on them, and then they show it in slow motion on TV, and it looks like my soul, how many gallons of that stuff was there. It comes out, just gushes all all over the guy. 
Did you know that's the definition of the word? Shed abroad in our hearts. Amen. He didn't give you a little touch right. of the Holy Ghost. Right. He didn't give you a little dose of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a person. Amen. You don't measure it. Right. You don't measure him. Amen. No. And, he, and here's what he said. He shed abroad his love in our heart by the Holy Ghost which is in us. Well, right there is the ability then to love God. Amen. That also gives me the ability to love on this level. See, so he says, beloved, keep yourselves in the love of God. I've thought about it this way. In Bible college, I worked in a, a cafeteria. I remember the last time I suggested to my wife, how about we go out and eat this cafeteria? She said, no. <laughs> only old people eat at cafeterias. And so... <laughs> We weren't that old yet. We were only 70. So anyway, uh, that, that's her mentality about it. But this is back when uh, cafeterias were in. There was some real nice, the cafeteria I worked in in Springfield, Missouri, worked my way through Bible college. I mean, it was a very nice place. People come in there dressed up, and it was near a real ritzy part of the community or the town there. And people came out on a Friday night and Saturday night, and they'd come in there and eat. And so I worked in this cafeteria. And um, uh, uh, one of my jobs was to clean up after they had special meetings and parties. Companies would rent a space, a room, they'd come in there. And I can remember going in before the days of all the whiteboards and all that kind of stuff, and they did the flip charts, you know. That was another time. I said, you know, and only certain age people said, yeah. The rest of them don't know. But it's a flip chart and it's paper. And I remember looking in there, and apparently they had meetings in there at times that would have to do with profit and loss, gain, progress, and decline, such as that. And sometimes and it would have maybe a quarterly report or maybe an annual report, and it would have this month is up and this month is down, this month is really up and this month is down. And so by the time you went through the year and you looked on that chart, it's all these peaks and valleys. It looked like a profile of the Rocky Mountains or something like that. Up and down, up and down, up and down. And I thought, what if they put my chart, what if God uh, uh, put on, uh, uh, on a chart uh, for me to see my love for him? From the time I got saved to the present time. Because the issue is not love God after he sheds his love abroad. Nobody has to tell you love God. You just got saved. He's your father. You're his child. His Holy Ghost is in you. You love God. That's not the issue, is it? The issue is what? Staying in love with God. Keeping yourself in love with God. And I thought about that. Oh, I hope he doesn't do that. Put it on a chart, especially through certain seasons and years of life when I know it was up and down. I mean, we'd have a revival at our church, or I would go to youth camp and come back from youth camp so fired up. I'd get out on the tractor as a teenage boy, and I remember standing on the tractor seat. This is against all safety rules, but I would stand on a tractor seat, no cabs and all air conditioners. <laughs> no, we were real farmers. And so stand on the tractor there, and we would do our work, and I'd be standing on that seat, and I'd be preaching like Harvey Springer did at camp. I mean, just letting her fly, yelling. And I remember plowing all night a few times, and I wondered what the jackrabbits and the coyotes thought about all the screaming and the yelling's going on. So I'm not sure about my doctrine, but I'm telling you, I was flinging her down, standing up there, <laughs> preaching away, and then singing the songs of camp. My heart was so full. It was just so full. Amen. Oh, man, it was wonderful. I got goosebumps right now thinking about it. But then I went to school, and then peer pressure got me. Whoever thought of peer pressure, I sure do appreciate it because if it wasn't for peer pressure, I'd have to take my backsliding. I'd have to take responsibility for that myself. But now I can blame it on the peer pressure. I told you no sarcasm, so what did I do? Turn right around and do it. So anyway, so, but I'm afraid. And then uh, uh, we'd have a revival in the fall, though. And then I, then I got to work during the revival after uh, seven or eight straight days. And I can remember one time, two solid weeks, Sunday through the third Sunday. Started on a Sunday and then the third Sunday it ended. And every one was about the coming of Christ and the rapture and prophecy and such as that. And a man came and preached it with great authority and great power. And I can remember by the time that was done, I thought, there's no way I'm graduating from high school. Jesus is coming before I do. There's no way I'll ever meet a girl and get married 
And she's hoped, at times, she has wished that he would have come before. But nonetheless, uh, I, there's no way that's going to happen I, because Jesus is coming. I remember getting so fired up. But then, you know, by the time you go to school and you hang out, and, uh, well, they took me down again. And then in the spring, we'd have a revival, and I was back up again. And then by the time I went to youth camp, I was back down again. And somebody said, you were a mess. Yeah, I know. I agree. I'm probably not alone. Amen. Two people are honest. I'm probably not alone. Amen. Uh, it doesn't make it right for me or anybody else. Right. You know what my problem was? I didn't keep myself in love with God. Why do you think there are admonitions like this, like from John? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why do you think that's so strong in there? Because we have uh, a, a penchant, we have a propensity to go back to the ways of the flesh and to let the world shape us into its mold. Isn't that right? The songwriter wrote it, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Yeah. So what do we do? Consciously, conscientiously, we're supposed to keep ourselves in the love of God. Amen. But how do you do that? Let's put the spokes on. Now, I'm not going to take as long on the spokes as I did this, but I want you to see something here. Look in verse 20. Here's the first spoke. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Uh, did you read the words there? Uh, whose responsibility is me? Uh, okay, whose responsibility is it in my life? Whose responsibility is it that I am built up on the most holy faith? It's my responsibility. It's, it's my responsibility. And what he is saying is, accept the responsibility to build yourself up on the most holy faith. Now, what does that mean? Somebody said, that's language I don't understand. Well, don't try to make it difficult. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and uh, that there is no building up oneself in the most holy faith without exercise in the Word of God. Amen. The preacher's brother asked me today at lunch, he said, uh, well, you seem to be in good shape. Do you work out? Do you do outdoor work and stuff like that? And my wife, I mean, I'm glad I brought her, but right there she goes, <laughs> <laughs> didn't you? Yeah, she did. She's confessing. I want to see you at the altar tonight. But anyway, she, and she goes, no. And, and I, well, I, I said, no, basically I have uh, type 2 diabetes, so I really watch what I eat most of the time. And so, you know, I just don't gain weight. But I wish I could say, because I remember the times I used to do push-ups because I well, wanted to keep myself fit and go as long as I could. I'd do push-ups, exercises, all that kind of thing. I'd run. I used to run, not like in marathons and that insanity. I didn't do that, but enough to keep the blood, you know, the heart pumping and all of that. And I used to do that. I can remember there were times from outdoor work. We lived on an acreage at that time. And I can remember times my wife would say, this didn't happen often, but enough that I remember it. And she would do like this and say, nice, nice. <laughs> Last time she did that, she said, what happened? Uh, it's just not there. <laughs> and I can find all kinds of excuses for why I'm not in the shape I was once in. But you don't want to hear them. It all boils down to this. I'm not exercising. Could I do push-ups? Yeah. Do I? Why don't you do push-ups and stuff? I don't want to. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I just don't want to do it. It's just that simple. So if I am not getting, you know, more firm and uh, having the hard uh, stomach muscles I used to have, what do you call it, the abs, you know, if I'm not doing that, you know whose responsibility is? Nobody's but mine. Amen. Nobody's but mine. And if in my spiritual life I am not building myself up in the most holy faith, we talked about Amen. you can never stop thinking higher and higher of God. Right. Well, there's no reason for any of us to not grow in the faith. The Lord. If we have the soundness of mind, we can continue to grow in the faith. Amen. And whose responsibility is that? Amen. And how does that happen? Uh, building up yourselves in the most holy faith by exercise in the word of God. Amen. I'm just saying, if a person is sitting in this room and you are not growing in the faith, don't 
point the finger at this pulpit. Amen. You have six other days or five other days if you're a, a Wednesday night attender to exercise yourself in the Amen. word. And besides that, I've become convinced, I probably can't prove it and might lose an argument about it. But I've become convinced that what we hear at the church and from the pulpit ought to supplement. Amen. Not be the main course, right. but supplement Amen. the exercise we have in the word ourselves. Amen. Build up yourselves on the most holy faith. Amen. Live in the Word. Amen. Visit good books. Right. But live in the Word. Amen. I read. I imagine you read. But I visit good books. And I trust no one but the book. Amen. Praise the Lord. I follow no one but the book. Is everybody with me here? Amen. Get in the Bible. Amen. Read your Bible. I'm so grateful for the day I heard the man preach when give his testimony, and he said, what's the most important book in the world? He was asked, and he said the Bible, and he was challenged. Why don't you read it like it is what it is, the most important Amen. book in the world? And while the preacher was telling his testimony, God was speaking to my heart. I was the pastor of Southwest Baptist Church in 1991 when this happened. I was 45 years of age. And when he gave the invitation, I was the first one at the altar saying, Oh Amen. God, I am using your Bible so I can have something to say to them. I have to have lessons to teach. I have to have sermons to preach. And I was using the Bible, preacher. This is a terrible thing to admit. I was using the Bible so I would have something to say to them more than I was just for God to speak to me. And since that day in 1991, well, four times a year, since I've been retired 12 years ago, five times a year, reading through the Bible, and I'm still marking, and I'm still looking at this, and I'm still saying like you told me, I'd never seen that before. I just had never seen that before. I'm just going to tell you right now, it was a game changer. It was a life changer. And we sing the song, Is Your Choir Ever Sung? God's Word Changes Lives. Have you heard that song? Powerful song. Our choir sing it, our college choir sing, God's Word Changes Life. Man, it's great. It's a powerful song. Everybody scream and yell amen. And then not treat the Bible so it would do what it's supposed to do. Change our lives. Build us up in the most holy faith. Amen. I, I submit this to you. You cannot exercise yourself in the Bible and not love God more. Amen. Well, there's a lot I don't understand. That's why you read it more than every five years. There it goes again. That's why you should read it more often. Amen. Yeah. Is everybody with me here? Amen. Yeah, it'll build you up. It's alive. This book is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll cut out of your heart what not belong there. It'll correct your thinking. It'll, it'll do surgery on your mind and your thinking. It'll help you there. And it'll build you up on the most holy faith. Yep. I was loading our suitcases. My suitcase to, for this two-week trip weighed 47 and a half pounds. I can remember throwing 47 and a half pounds around like it was nothing. Thinking, good night, this leg weighs 114 pounds. No telling what I'm going to get. Yeah. And it's amazing if you'll stay in shape, what you're able to lift, even a skinny guy. If you know what you're able to lift, how strong you really are. And there may be people, listen to me, friend, there may be people that you may not esteem very highly in terms of their walk, but if that very person or if it's you yourself, whoever you are, you exercise yourself in the most Amen. holy faith. You exercise yourself in the Word of God. And I've seen people that just by reason of their love and devotion to the Word of God have manifest great faith. Praise the Lord. Bill spoke one, spoke two, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, we're Baptists. We don't know about that praying in the Holy Ghost. Oh, come on, please. <laughs> Likewise, everybody listening? The Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, Amen. but He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, because He, the Holy Spirit, knows the mind of God. Amen. 
And so what we are supposed to do is pray in the Holy Ghost, which has nothing to do with some kind of a sensation that comes over you and your tongue gets loose and nobody knows what you're saying. That has never been praying in the Holy Ghost. It means to pray in utter dependence upon the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we know not what to pray for as we ought. Our prayers would change if we quit telling God how to be God. If we just quit saying to God, here's what you could do and asking him to do what we think he ought to do rather than coming before God and confessing our own insufficiency and inadequacy and lack of knowledge and pray in dependence upon the eternal wisdom of the Holy Spirit of God who makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Glory to God. Amen. Maybe the bigger question is, do you pray? Not an accusation, but it's a fair question. Do you pray? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, see, three meals a day, seven days a week. Not really what I'm talking about. Jesus said, but when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and shut thy door. Get alone with God. I wonder what the psalmist meant in Psalm 46 when he said, Be still and know that I am God. I wonder what it means to be still. It means to shut stuff out that makes right. noise. Amen. Not just noise to your ear, noise in your mind. Amen. Shut her down. Shut it down. Amen. My wife says, What is it you say I have? Hey, what is that? Huh? Attention deficit. She, has, I, she says, I have attention deficit. <laughs> I don't know why she says that. <laughs> but what was I just saying? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I can tell you right now, after, and I haven't preached it yet, but I've got to preach Psalm 46. It's just not ready yet. But I want to preach Psalm Amen. 46. When I start asking God, God, help me shut my mind down. I don't want to think about where I've been, where I'm supposed to go, what I've got to do next. I don't want to think about that. Help me. I found he's helped me. Praise Jesus. Indeed, praise Jesus. He wants us to commune with him and be still and know that he is God. Enter into thy closet and shut thy door. When thou shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. That's what Jesus said. I have people all the time tell me, yeah, I, drive, I pray on my way to work. Well, I guess if you live in major cities and so forth, that's a good idea. Amen. <laughs> or if you're on a trip through Philadelphia, New York City, or right. Chicago, or somewhere like that, yes, pray without ceasing. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Now, is it? No. no, he's not talking about that. He's talking about getting alone. Amen. If the only time I have conversation with my wife is in the company of other people, how deep is our relationship going to be? Answer the question, friend. How deep is our relationship going to be? If the only times I talk to her and converse with her is when we're in the midst of other people. No, there has to be that intimate time. There has to be that time just for a man and his wife. And there has to be a time for just you and God. Look at me a second. No, listen to this, no love relationship thrives apart from meaningful communion. Right, amen. None. Two people stand at the marriage altar and get married, they almost need oxygen. They're so in love they can hardly talk, (laughs) except each other, but they can hardly say I do or answer the questions the preacher says. Oh, they're just so in love. And five years later, you look at the same couple and they're sitting across the desk and they're wondering why they ever got married to begin with. What happens? They go and live in the same house. They go their own ways, pursuing their own careers. They're after this, after that. They're going this way and that way and they take no time with each other and wonder why their relationship has gone cold. No love relationship thrives without meaningful communion. You can say a prayer And then you can have meaningful communion with God. They are not necessarily the same thing. Amen. Thank you. That's very true. None. 
Our oldest daughter is Cindy. She's daddy's girl. Funny, fun, precious, till she turned 13. I'm saying to the woman, who is that girl in Cindy's room? I don't even know her anymore. Hateful, belligerent, defensive, blah, blah, blah. The man said, it was tough. It was tough on her mom. It was tough on us. I, it broke my heart. What is happening to this child? So I just said, we've got to have a talk. Cindy and I sat down, started talking to Cindy. And I said, but Cindy, you always this and whatever it was I was talking about, I made the mistake of saying, it's always this, you always, and you're, I exaggerated the situation, I'm sure. And she said, Dad, no, that's not even what I'm thinking. No, well, tell me what you're thinking. Okay, she told me what she was thinking. I thought, I didn't know that. And she said, but Dad, whenever then, you always, no, Cindy, no, that's not what I'm thinking. We sat there for however long, and we talked this thing out, not just once, but more than once. We talked this thing out, and then I began to understand her better. She's going through changes in her life, and, and she's becoming somebody different, and I have to understand what she's doing. She thought I was thinking this way, and I was thinking another way. We had to understand, look at me a second. Parents love their children and can become strangers. Children can become strangers in your own house without meaningful communion. Right. And if God seems distant to you, I'm going to stick my neck way out and say, He's probably not the problem. Amen. Good. He is not the problem. Amen. Shut her down, friend. Right. Amen. Take time to spend time in His presence. Take time to know Him. I urge you to ask Him. Yeah, but Brother Sam, you don't know how, how my schedule is. I had a fairly schedule in my life, busy myself. But I know this. He wants to meet with you. He Amen. wants to commune with you. Take time to worship Him. Amen. The world will wait. Right. Take time to worship Him. Good. Talk of His greatness. Talk of His goodness. Amen. My wife doesn't need a lot of praise. She tells me something good, and I smart off to her, so I can't hardly even get her to say anything nice to me anymore. But I say thanks to my wife about, well, she's still the most beautiful woman in the world to me. Good. And talk to her about the things I love about her and that I appreciate about her. Well, what do you think that does? Build or destroy? What do you think is happening? Amen. Good. Build. Meaningful communion. Right. What do you think that does for the love factor? Well, it perpetuates it. It Amen. keeps it going. It warms it up. Of course. God, our God is a great God and a great Amen. King above all gods. He's high and lofty. Hallelujah. His glory is above the heavens. Amen. He inhabits eternity. Praise His name is holy. Amen. Tell Him how amazing it is. This, this is what hit me lately. How amazing it is when I was thinking, I just taught or preached on the high and lofty nature of God, and I'm in my office in a, in a retirement home area where my wife and I live, and all of these houses, about 80 or 90 of them, that all look just exactly alike, and they're about this far apart. And I'm living in that house there, and I'm in my office, and I'm by myself, and I'm in Oklahoma City, and there, there's a, there are a lot of cities in this country. And here I am in Oklahoma City, not necessarily the hub of all life in the United States. And here I am in Oklahoma, and here I am in the United States, and there are a lot of other countries in the world. Here I am one person, and there's over 7 billion people in the world. And here's God that before him the nations are a drop of Amen. a bucket. And here's this farm kid saved by the grace of God, Praise bound God. down Amen. in my office and talking to God about him and trusting him as I try to have him help me Amen. still my mind and soul so I can Good. concentrate on him and just gain this incredible awareness that of all of his creation, all of his creation, and all the other homes that are here and cities that are in America, of all the other people, seven billion strong in the world, he's here. Praise the Lord. Amen. He's here. Amen. I'm not talking about some spooky experience. Right. 
I'm not saying if you've never had that happen, you're not serious about prayer. It doesn't happen like that every time. But God wants you to know Him and draw near to Him. And you can't draw near to God and not love Him more. Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah. You, you cannot possibly commune with God and talk to Him in genuineness and sincerity and shut all else all else out to worship and to commune with him. You cannot do that and not come away loving him Amen. more. Right. You can't, Good. beloved. And it has everything to do with keeping yourself in the love of God. Amen. Well, he seems so distant, but he's not too busy for you. Praise Jesus. Amen. Yeah. He's not thinking about so many other things he can't think about you. God doesn't live with the limitations we live with. Right. Beloved, pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Take time Amen. to pray. Amen. Look at the next spoke. This is going to be quick. Look for the mercy of our Lord. End of verse 21. <laughs> Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Amen. Can I have your attention? Without developing the argument uh, that it can easily be developed, but without developing the argument, he's talking about the coming of Jesus. When Jesus comes in the rapture, there are Amen. some that don't even believe in this kind of stuff, but it's way too clear in the Bible. Amen. When Jesus comes in the rapture, that is an act of mercy. Amen. And we are mercifully right. delivered from the judgment that is coming in that tribulation period. And we're to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Anticipate the coming of Jesus Christ. Look at me a second. Somebody says, well, I'm not necessarily thinking about that much. You will if you read the Bible. That's why you build up yourself in the most holy faith. That's why you live in the Word of God. You'll be looking for Jesus to come if you know daily communion with Him. And His presence is real to you. And, and, and don't you know that when we're anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ, we act and live differently than we're, if we're not Amen. expecting the coming right. of Jesus right. Christ. Right. Absolutely. Anticipate His coming. There's an old preacher in South Georgia, uh, North Georgia uh, named uh, uh, Sammy Allen. Sammy Allen is a camp meeting preacher. Did you ever hear of him? Did you ever hear him preach? Now, I've asked people, did you ever hear Sammy Allen preach? I don't know. I said, you haven't. Because I'm just telling you right now, you don't forget it. But he quoted about 150 verses every time he preached. And he was preaching about the second coming of Christ. And he had a preacher get up there and he said, pull up your pants leg. The guy said, sir? He said, pull your pants leg up. The guy pulled his pants leg up and showed his ugly shin. And he said, the other one pulled it up and showed his shin. He said, he ain't looking for the coming of Jesus. If we're serious about the coming of Jesus, we're walking around like this, running into stuff all the time, and he'd have black and blue marks on his chin. <laughs> now, I don't know if he could prove that by the Bible, but the idea is we ought to be looking that way. Somebody say amen. He's got the right idea. We are supposed to be anticipating and looking for Jesus to come again. And if we're not anticipating coming, it probably says we're not spending much time with him. And if we're not spending much time with him, we're not going to love his appearing like we are supposed to do. We're not supposed to just love our disappearing from this confused world. We're supposed to love his appearing. Anticipate the coming of Jesus. And the last one is, if some have compassion, making a difference, others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. What could that be if not soul winning? Amen. Of course it is. You don't treat everybody the same. Right. What do you mean everybody's got to get saved the same way? I know. But you ever read in the Bible about that Cornelius guy? The scripture says he was a good man. Yeah, the Bible says there ain't nothing good. Okay, I, I'm with you. But it also says he was a good man. So there's nobody that's good in themselves that makes them righteous with God. But are there people that have made some right and proper and choice, uh, moral choices? Yes, and he was one of them. He prayed to God. He gave alms, though he wasn't even saved. He believed in the existence of Elohim. And he prayed to God. And he gave alms to the poor. So he did some things that were right. Well, you don't go up to a Cornelius and say, Look, buddy, you're going to burn in hell someday. No. You go to Cornelius and say, Cornelius, good men have to be saved too. Amen. That's good. 
Now, that's a good line. Good men have to be saved too. Amen. Doesn't matter how many alms you've given. It doesn't matter how many times you have called out to the God who is. The only way you can come to him is by Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what Jesus said. No man comes to the Father but by me. Uh, so until you do that, you don't have any real communion with God. God's Amen. mindful of you. He knows you. Sent me here to talk to you. Amen. You don't go up there. But then you don't take the guy either. I remember preaching Wichita Falls. And I was preaching out of, uh, on the matter of soul winning. That's what I was asked to preach on. And I was using this passage here. And I walked up to a guy. It's the first time I'd ever preached in a church. I'd never met this man in my life. And I just walked up to him and says, Now, if you've got a guy like this man, this is a man that's talk, uh, that he's talking about, uh, saved with fear, pulling him out of the fire. Because I'm going to tell you right now, this man's a, uh, he's a heartbeat from hell. He beats his wife. He's a drunkard. He's mean to his kids. I didn't know who the guy was. I had no idea. Next thing I look down, he's crying. I'm thinking, oh, great. What have I done now while I'm still preaching, you know? And I'm just saying that. Well, I found out after church that this guy had been saved about a month. And everything that I was saying, he says, exactly what his life was like. Now he's come and he's found Jesus Christ. There he is at the revival meeting and he gets hammered again. You know, like, anyway, but, but, that's, but you talk to a man like that. And I've sat with some guys. I've said, I can't say many, but I've sat with some guys and say, you can go ahead and give your wife a hard time. I remember Steve Eby talking to him like this. Look, Steve, you can give your wife a hard time. You can make fun of her from going to church. You can try to get in the way of her bringing your kids to church. You can scoff and you can mock, but when you die, bud, you're going to hell. You need to know that. You die as you are, and you'll burn in hell. And there'll be no cocky attitudes then, I'll guarantee you that. Amen. Of some save with fear, pulling him out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. But the idea is, are we doing anything to try to keep somebody out of hell and have their sins forgiven Amen. and go to heaven? It's a part of, listen to this, it's a part of keeping ourselves in the love of God, or keeping ourselves in love with God. Excuse me just a second. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And the more you seek and try to see people saved that are lost, it's not, I've gotten to where I hate sinners. That's not how it works. Amen. To the contrary, you're growing your love for sinners. Amen. And we're not really serious if we're not manifesting the kind of love that he had for us towards other people. Is everybody with me here? Yes. Building up yourselves on the most holy faith, exercising in the Word of God, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost, anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ, and then invest yourselves in the salvation of others. And guess what happens? Your love for Him is not a chart of ups and downs and highs and lows. If he means for us to keep ourselves in the love of God, there's a way to do it. He gave us the way to do it. Amen. There's no need for our, right. listen, there's no need for our love for God to be measured like this. There's no need for that. Amen. It can be like this. Well, nobody's perfect. Yeah, really. Yes, you're right. But then come back and build up yourself Amen. and pray. You say, I used to do that, and I'm, I'm where I am today. Come back. Amen. It's good. G get back in the Word. Amen. It's as alive as it's ever been. Praise the Lord. Amen. Get, back, get back in the, along with God. Amen. He wants to meet with you. Thank you, Jesus. He's out on the porch looking right. for you to come home. Amen. Come back. Humble yourself. Admit. It wasn't somebody at church. It wasn't that job I lost. It wasn't those. Per it, no, it's nobody's fault. If you're not in love with God, go look in the mirror. Amen. It's you. Right. It's you. Come back. Beloved.